welcome back in this video we are going to talk about energy efficiency and as you can recall we are talking about energy demand under module 2 and this is what where we are going to focus on so this is one of the behavioral aspects with regard to demand side management now the question is we start with this question what do you understand by energy efficiency in previous week we had a discussion on energy intensity which was the energy consumption divided by output produced. So energy efficiency, the concept of energy efficiency is just the opposite. So if you have to consume more energy to produce same amount of output, your energy efficiency will go down. However, if you can consume less energy to produce the same amount of output, then your energy efficiency will go up. So it's, it's a reciprocal concept of energy intensity. So reduction is ener in energy use per unit of output or energy produced is called energy efficiency. We are going to have a quick look at how energy efficiency plays a role in the whole policy discourse in India with respect to energy demand reduction or energy uh, management. Here we are going to discuss about the national mission on enhanced energy efficiency. So you may be aware of the fact in 2008, India took up national mission uh, National Action Plan on Climate Change NAPCC in 2008 and under National Mission or National Action Plan on Climate Change there are eight national missions and one of them is the National Mission on Enhanced Energy Efficiency. Now what is the objective of adopting the NAPCC the National Action Plan on Climate Change? Basically in order to comply with the international you know effort to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, India said that okay, we are going to you know put forward our effort in terms of reducing the emission intensity of our GDP. So the total emission may not go down, but the emission that is coming out of production of per unit of GDP will come down. And enhanced energy efficiency was considered to be one of the main driving forces which can help the country achieving a reduction in the emission intensity of GDP. So this is one of the important and key components of NAPCC in India. And the objective was not only to promote energy efficiency, but also you know to come up with a market based concept to come up to generate some kind of market incentive so that you know people anyway go forward to take up measures which are energy efficient in nature. If you look at the national mission on energy efficiency, you will see that there are three building blocks of that. Although they mention, you know, four uh, components in this, two of the components are very similar. And that's why I'm saying there are three building blocks. The first one is called Perform, Achieve and Trade. This is the PAT scheme. This is the energy efficiency scheme, which was taken up by under this program uh, for the energy intensive industries. We'll have a detailed discussion on this in the coming slides. The next one is market transformation for energy efficiency. So the whole you know, concept was that energy efficiency should not only come as a mandate, but it should have it should actually uh, tell people where the financial gain lies. So there has to be a market transformation and there has to be a financial mechanism. So under market transformation, there are two most prominent uh, attempts that were taken. One is the budget lamp Jojana, where you know the incandescent in place of the incandescent bulbs, households were encouraged to uh, fix the uh, the CFL lamps, and these CFLs were provided at the 15 rupees per for one CFL, where the cost is almost equal to the incandescent bulb. The other was the super efficient equipment program under this market transformation. So under market transformation for energy efficiency, what the government did, the government identified that this energy efficient equipment, they have high initial cost. Although the energy cost, although I mean the running cost that they uh, will go for is much lower than the energy inefficient equipment, but there is a first cost barrier. So these two programs were taken up in order to remove that first cost barrier. So energy efficient equipment were being provided to the customer at the cost which is same as the existing low energy efficient equipment. So this removes the first cost barrier. However, it requires a lot of investment. So if, if I want to supply all the households with the CFL or for example, I want to supply all the agricultural farmers with energy efficient pumps, then it, it, it actually it's a matter of lot of money. Where do the government get this amount of money? 
So the model, there was some financial mechanism that was developed and it was said that okay, the initial investment will be probably done by some energy service companies and how will they be repaid? Because once the energy efficient equipment is installed, the customers will realize a financial savings in terms of reduced electricity bills. So once the electricity bills are reduced over a period of time, there will be some financial savings and the customer will actually pay the energy service com companies over a period of time out of this financial savings. So the first cost barrier has been removed and the payment will be made over a period of time. This kind of uh, was thought to promote the uh, market transformation of energy efficiency and other than that there are certain other financial mechanism which was developed one was called the finance energy efficiency financing platform and the other is called the framework for energy efficient economic development so if you go to the document of national uh, mission on energy enhanced energy efficiency what you will see that these two programs that is energy efficiency financing platform efp and uh, framework for e economic development these two are uh, these two will appear as two different programs but their objectives are same so what they essentially try to do is that they wanted to come up with certain mou and different understanding uh, between the financial sector and the government or the nodal agency in the government so let us see who are the implementing agencies of this program national mission on enhanced energy efficiency this particularly falls under the ministry of power so uh, ministry of power actually came up with energy conservation act in 2001 where a huge thrust was given how india can actually enhance its energy efficiency and under this act in the year 2002 the nodal body was set up which was called the bureau of energy efficiency bee if you go to the website of the bureau of energy efficiency you will get a lot of information about all the energy efficiency policies that are in India, uh, that are in India, and you can also have a look at different thrust area that uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency have has at different levels. So they have some, you know, uh, some area related to the building energy efficiency, some plan related to industrial energy efficiency, residential, agricultural sector, and so on. And about different market mechanisms so it, it's worth you know going and visiting the website of bureau of energy efficiency to uncover the energy efficiency policies in india the other one is important and interesting this is eesl this is the energy efficiency services limited this is one of the energy service uh, companies in india which actually uh, is, is a it, it's owned by the government of india the ministry of power but it creates this kind of platform so when when we were talking about you know providing the farmers with the uh, efficient uh, efficient uh, these pumps then we talked that then we said that eesl is the one who is undertaking the initial investments and farms are paying back to the uh, to eesl so these are the energy service company whose role has become very, very important in the context of promoting energy efficiency policies in India. What we are going to do here is that we are going to look at uh, a couple of thrust areas of Bureau of Energy Efficiency, which have come up with very significant energy efficiency policies with some visible outcome. So first of all, we are going to look at in details the policy called Perform, Achieve and Trade in India. Let us first have a look at what is the mechanism of perform achieve and trade. So think about two industrial units. So the first industrial unit, this is called unit A and this is its baseline scenario and this is called unit B. Here I have given the details of some imaginary baseline scenario. So unit A, so this industrial unit, it's producing 100 units of output. You can think of both of them from the same industry or from different industry, it doesn't matter. So they, both of them, they may be, you know, producing uh, steel. So the total output is 100 unit. Total energy consumed is 600 tons of oil equivalent. So what is the specific energy consumption? The specific energy consumption is basically a measure of energy intensity. Okay. So the specific energy consumption is total energy consumption that is 600 divided by total output that is 100. So the SEC that is the specific energy consumption is 6. So this will be measured in some suitable unit. In case of the second uh, industrial unit, which is unit B, the baseline scenario is this. So this is a bigger plant. 
the output produced is 200 units. Total energy consumed is 400 tons of oil equivalent and therefore the specific energy consumption is 1400 divided by 200 which is equal to 7. Now what Perform Achieve and Trade had done when it was initiated, it actually identified who are the energy intensive industries in India, who are the most energy intensive industries in India and under these industries they surveyed all the units which are bigger enough and who has high energy intensity. And for each of these industrial units, finally it was 428 industrial units, they carried out this baseline study where they out identified the total input output, they identified what is the specific energy consumption and they also identified what could be the possible benchmark that each of these units can achieve. Where, it, where is the potential for energy efficiency? So each of the units underperform achieve and trade in the first cycle, they received a threshold that they have to re reach. For example, let us take this target as this. So the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, after surveying both the units, they identify that both of them can improve their energy efficiency so that for both of them, the specific energy consumption should become 5. So for unit A, it has to reduce the specific energy consumption that is the energy intensity from 6 to 5 and for this unit, they have to reduce it, seven, uh, uh, reduce it from 7 to 5. So these are the targets set by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency for these two units. So I will just give you one piece of information where the uh, National Mission on Energy Efficiency was planned and PAT was being designed. Initially, BE thought that they will have one single benchmark that is one single specific energy consumption target for all the units under one particular industry. So all the iron and steel industries will get one target. All, paper uh, all the units under paper industry will get one target. So that was the initial plan and it was planned that PATH will be launched in the year of 2010. However, what happened when they started collecting the data and they started visiting different units, they found out that, you know, different units under one particular industry are very different in nature. So you cannot probably have the same specific energy consumption target, uh, energy, uh, specific energy consumption target for all the units under uh, iron and steel or for all the units under cement industry. So the scope of energy efficiency varied from one unit to the other. So they did a very rigorous job at that point of time, they delayed the implementation a bit. But what they did, they, did, they collected a detailed data from each of the units where PAT was supposed to be implemented. For each of the units, they came up with a specific target. So let us assume these two are two such units out of 428 units where the first cycle of PAT was implemented. And both of them, they have received the target to reduce their specific energy consumption, one from 6 to 5 and the other is from 7 to 5. But however, they do not have to reduce their total production because that is not going to help because we are talking about the intensity. Now suppose some efforts are made by unit A and what does it do? Instead of achieve, it not only achieves this target, but it rather over achieves the target. So instead of achieving 5 specific energy consumption, the specific energy consumption of unit A becomes 4. So it becomes more energy efficient than it was required to be. Now what happens if the total output remains unchanged, that is the 100 unit and now the specific energy consumption is 4. So what is the total requirement of energy of this particular unit? It is 400 ton of oil equivalent. Okay. What was the target? The target was actually 500 ton of oil equivalent. It would have been satisfied the Bureau of Energy Efficiency specified target had it reduced the energy consumption to 500 ton of equivalent and oil equivalent. However, it has reduced further. So it has overachieved 100 ton of oil equivalent energy saving. Okay. Let us next see what happens in case of unit B. So unit B it has not invested much, it invested less in enhanced energy efficiency and as a result what happens, instead of achieving specific energy consumption 5, it achieves only 6. So its specific energy consumption is reduced from 7 to 6. So what is happening with this, this unit? So it under achieves 200 tons of energy, uh, energy saving because of this gap of 
one specific energy consumption for 200 units. So for each unit of production, they are lagging behind by one ton of oil equivalent. So for 200 units of production, they are lagging behind 200 tons of oil equivalent. Now you can see there is an opportunity to come up with a market. What is happening? This, this unit A, it has overachieved. So it has, it has some energy efficiency which it can sell. And this guy, this unit B, it has underachieved. So it wants to buy energy efficiency. And this scope was exploited under the mechanism of PAT. So what it said that the unit who has underachieved, they will be supplied with some energy saving certificates. So this ESART, it stands for energy saving certificates. Because the saving is 100 ton of oil equivalent, for each ton of oil equivalent, the government or the BEE, it's the same, will issue one energy certificate to this overachiever, which can be sold in the market. Okay, so this unit A it gets 100 energy saving certificates. Now what happens to the underachiever? The underachiever has two options. What are the two options? One, it can buy energy saving certificates from the unit who is selling the energy saving certificates or it can pay a penalty. So now see if you think about this particular market and there are only two entities in the market, what is happening? There is a supply of 100 energy saving certificates. However, there is a demand for 200 energy saving certificates. So what unit B can do, it can buy 100 energy saving certificates from unit A and pay the penalty for the rest of the 100 units. But here you have to be careful that the penalty structure should be designed in such a way that the penalty per unit penalty that unit B has to pay should be higher than the you know the price of ESARTs in the market. If the penalty is lower than the price of ESART then unit B will only pay the penalty and this market mechanism will not work. There will be excess supply of ESART in the market. Now, when you see this is the kind of mechanism, so I will just stay here for a while. So when you see this kind of mechanism, it is very important to identify this number 5 to come up with the appropriate benchmarking, to come up with the appropriate target. Because if the target is not set appropriately, there is a possibility that there will be oversupply of ESARTs in the market or there will be you know excess demand of ESARTs in the market. And if that is the case, then the excess supply of ESART will actually lead to a price crash of the ESART because you are thinking about a market mechanism here. The demand and supply will interact and reveal the, mar uh, reveal the market price. So the government said that there is no floor price, there is no ceiling price, let the demand and supply interact and reveal the price. Now if that is the situation and the target is not very stringent, then most of the people will overachieve. And if everybody overachieves, there will be oversupply of ESARTs in the market and the price will crash. However, if you make the target too stringent and nobody overachieves, everybody underachieves, then what happens? Then there will be a large number of, you know, uh, buyers. Uh, it, so there will be a large number of uh, buyers of this. However, the, you know, the supply will be limited and this excess demand will short up the price of ESART like anything. So you don't want any of those situations to happen. Actually, if you can, you can go back to the literature on uh, EU ETS, which is European Union Emission Trading Screen, which is very similar to this. Here we are talking about buying and selling of energy saving certificates. There you talk about buying and selling of carbon certificates, carbon saving certificates. So what happened there, the target that they made was so less stringent then everybody actually overachieved the target and everybody wanted to sell their carbon certificates. And therefore, the, in the first phase of EU ETS, the price actually crashed. The whole market crashed, the whole mechanism crashed. So that was one of the criticisms about the first cycle of um, EU ETS. And it gives a nice comparison with this, this situation. So let, this is the mechanism of that. Now let us see what, what actually happened, what was the target and what was achieved. So the first cycle of PAT was introduced during the period 2012-13 to 2014-15. So over a period of three years, 
some 428 DCs, DCs are the designated consumer. So, one unit is considered to be, industrial unit was considered to be one designated consumer. There were 428 designated consumers who were identified to be highly energy intensive in nature. Data were collected from all of these 428 designated uh, consumers and a benchmark was created. So, each of these designated consumers, they got their own target to achieve. So, it, there was no blanket target for any of the industries. Each of these 428 received their own targets to achieve. Who are the industries which were the part of the first cycle of PAT? These are the most energy intensive industries. Aluminium, cement, chloralkali, fertilizer, iron and steel, pulp and paper, thermal power plants and textile. If you recall our discussion on reduction in energy efficiency, the six charts that I was showing in the industries where the energy intensity has been declining, you will see that these are the industries that we were talking about. These are the most energy intensive industries in India. And anyway, industry, uh, you know, consumes most of the energy that is produced in the country as well. Okay, so the target was to save, the total energy saving that was targeted was 6.69 MTOE. And what was achieved was quite fascinating. It's more than 6.69 MTOE and this is 8.67 MTOE. So, most of the industries, most of the industrial units, they actually overachieved the target. Now, uh, if you think about the avoided energy use of this particular amount, this is equivalent to uh, avoiding emission of 31 million tons of carbon dioxide and in monetary value that is equivalent to 9,500 9, rupees crores. So, there is a huge savings which took place. But it again takes us to the discussion, uh, do you actually want all the units to overachieve? How did the you know buying and selling of ESA went on after the overachievement took place? So, later we will see when we discuss about the you know the buying and selling of ESARTs, we will see that the overachievement was quite okay in terms of the fact that the price of ESARTs never crashed. But one ha has to be very careful to understand what is the supply and demand of ESARTs in this context. So, let us see what happened in uh, the cycle 1. This is the this is perhaps the most important part because here you start talking about the market mechanism. So, as you see, it is overachieved. So, this is quite clear that some, some of the units, they have got the energy saving certificates. If you look at the data, you will see that there were 309 designated consumers out of this, designated customers out of this 428 DCs who overachieved. And to them, 38.5 lakh ESARTs were issued. And 110 DCs were actually underachievers. And they had to buy from these 309 DCs. So, 14.5 lakh ESARTs were actually, sub they have to buy 14.5 lakh of ESARTs in order to meet the shortfall. So, clearly you can see the, you know, the supply exceeds the demand. This part is there. So, in a sense, it is good that we have overachieved. We have saved a lot of money and we have saved a lot of carbon dioxide emission as well. But you can see clearly that the supply exceeds the demand. So, the realized price of ESART in the market, which is actually should be a bit lower. Had these two things been close, it would have been a bit higher. So, one has to be careful when setting up the target. The other thing is that since the supply exceeds the demand, there should be a banking option with the ESART. So, you can, you know, keep the ESARTs in a bank and you, know, you should be able to sell it during the next period. So, this kind of mechanism should be there. As I already mentioned that price was discovered completely, you know, uh, in a competitive manner. There was no floor or ceiling price that was set by the government. If you want to look at the, you know, the how the price was discovered in the market, you can go to the website of IEX India and it actually tells you how the bidding went on, what is the total volume of sale and how the price actually moved. After this, so this transaction is for the first cycle of PAC. Next one, this was done, there was the second cycle of PAC. This is 2016-17 to 2018-19. For another three years, this, this was implemented. So, some more DCs were added. So, under the second cycle of PAD, there were altogether 621 designated consumers. Other than these eight industries, three more industries were added, railways, refineries and the DISCOMs, that is the distribution companies, the power distribution companies. 
In the second cycle, the target was to achieve 8.87 million ton of oil equivalent of energy saved. This data is yet to come, how much it we have achieved because it, it has just ended. So this data is yet to come. We don't know how much we have achieved and how the, you know, the market transaction will go on. But what we can see from the first cycle of PAC, you know, as an experiment, it was quite successful because the market mechanism could be incorporated. Because one thing when, uh, if you just go and talk to the industries, some of them, they will say you don't need sort of an energy efficiency policy to be in the place. Because energy itself is so expensive, it's becoming so expensive that the industries, they have their own interest in order to reduce their energy intensity. So they will anyway work towards energy efficiency. So this, these kind of studies could be interesting so to see. If you remove policies like PAT, will you achieve the same result? What is the additionality which is given by PAT? So these are the questions which are interesting to ask. And in my opinion, I mean, this market mechanism is of course something which can't be introduced if each of the industries individually practicing energy efficiency uh, measures. After 2018-19, the PAC cycle 3, 4 and the uh, forthcoming one is 5, they will go on as a running, a rolling basic. So every year some new DCs will be added and every year some new targets will be given. So th this was more like an experimental phase and now we have entered into the phase where every year a new cycle of PAC will come. Now when you see this kind of a mechanism in place, the immediate question comes, who are the people who are you know organizing this or overseeing the whole mechanism who are the stakeholders let us have a quick look at the stakeholders for pact so central electricity regulatory commission is the market regulator from the pact the whole scheme comes under the ministry of power and the, it is administered by the bureau of energy efficiency this is the nodal agency for any energy efficiency program in india this again falls under ministry of power the registry is, uh, so by registry we mean by this, the registration, I mean who does the registration of the companies who want to buy or sell ESART. So registry was the Power System Operation Corporation Limited, POSCO was the registry for this program. And uh, where was this ESART uh, bought and sold? It was bought and sold in two power exchange in India. One is the IXC. So why, when I said that you may visit the website of IXC, this is basically one of the power exchange where the purchase and uh, selling of ESARTs went on. This IEX and the other is that Pixel, this uh, power exchange limited in India. So these are the two designated power exchange companies who conducted the buying and selling of ESARTs under PAT. Again, you can go back to the website of BEE and identify what is the uh, mechanism and what are the results and, and all. So one uh, note of caution is that when you look at these different numbers, you can see that the numbers may vary from one document to other document little bit. Uh, I am not in a position to give you the explanation why the number varies but if, even if you extract the documents from the BE website in two different documents you may find out two different numbers but they are pretty much close. So uh, this, is, this is one thing I wanted to mention. So after the industrial energy efficiency which uh, seems to be quite effective in India, we come to the next flagship program by Bureau of Energy Efficiency which is called the standards and leveling. So when we talk about the standards and leveling, this is a statement from the BE, uh, BE website itself. A key objective of this scheme is to provide the consumer an informed choice about the energy saving and thereby the cost saving potential of the relevant marketed product. So I would like you to focus on the part informed choice. So often the consumers do not make a choice based on, uh, I mean when they make a choice, all the information are not available to them. So when we were talking about load management, we said that it's good to have a dynamic price where you have higher price during the peak period and, uh, sorry, you have a higher, yeah, you have a higher price during the peak period and lower price during the off-peak period. But it's not only having the dynamic price, it's also about communicating the information to the consumer so that they can take some informed decision. So here also they are all they are talking about the consumer taking some informed decision about energy saving and thereby cost saving potential of relevant marketed product. The scheme targets uh, display of energy performance levels 
on high energy end use equipment and appliances and lay down minimum energy performance standards if you want to know about it in details you can visit the website of BEE. Let us have a quick look what do we actually understand by standard and leveling and why is it so important in order to uh, you know allow the consumer to make an informed choice. So how does the decision towards energy efficiency is taken? This is actually very interesting because as a consumer when I go and buy for example I want to buy a refrigerator what do I look at? I go to the shop, I ask what is the price of the, you know, the refrigerator. I might have some brand preference. I, I prefer brand A over brand B. So I, I stick to one brand. I may also, you know, look for a particular color that I want to use. But I, it, it's not very common that a customer, you know, uh, walks down in a shop and asks what is the energy consumption of this particular refrigerator. That is usually not the first question that you ask. You ask about the other things. So what we can say is that energy efficiency is and now it's, it's not so much but it used to be a very ignored aspect of you know decision making of a consumer. You, when you used to go by these kind of uh, cues, these kind of hints and not by the energy efficiency. So a good example is to compare energy efficiency uh, with a cricket match where the fielder is where, where a very good fielder actually saves a lot of run but when you look at the you know the result of a cricket match you will only talk about how much runs are scored by the batsmen or how much uh, how many wickets are taken by the bowlers you never discuss about how many runs are saved by the fielders so this is this is somewhat that ignored aspect of energy consumption so energy efficiency was an ignored as aspect however things have changed a little bit so what I did, I just, you know, gave a Google search for LG refrigerators in India and I wanted to see what are the results coming up. So this was the result that I got. If you look here, you see, so these are the different LG refrigerators that you can see and this is along with the, you know, the capacity of the refrigerator, what you are getting, you are getting 4 star, you are getting 4 star, 4 star, 1 star. So it's giving you the star rating as the second most important information. So when a consumer is looking at it, of course you are looking at the size, you are looking at the price, you are looking at the brand, you are looking at the first cost, but also you are bound to look at these terms called 4 star, 4 star, 4 star and 1 star. So it actually gives the consumer information about the energy intensity, the energy that is consumed by these, uh, this, uh, the, uh, by these, you know, refrigerators, and which is more efficient. So if you look at these these two refrigerators, this uh, so one maybe I'll I'll ask you to compare between these two. So this is a 185 liter refrigerator. And there you have a 215 liter refrigerator. So because this is one star, the price is much lower. If I had not given you this information, you would have thought this is a much cheaper option and this is good to buy. But the moment I give you this option, you are bound to think, okay, here the price is less, but probably I'll end up spending more in terms of my electricity bill. So by, you know, mentioning this start by mentioning the label you are actually giving the con you are forcing the consumer to base her decision on some information on energy efficiency so this is how the stars and this is how the labels provided by bee look like if you look at the labels for for refrigeration you see refrigerator you see there are five stars here the more number of stars are covered by the red area higher will be the energy efficiency of that particular equipment. So now, other than the capacity, the first cost, the look, the color, the brand, how many stars are covered by red will also guide your decision making. So nowadays, as compared to, you know, 15 years back, nowadays if you go to the market, if you go to a shop, you want to buy a refrigerator, at least few customers you will see that they are talking about the star rating. They are saying that I want to buy a 4 star or 5 star refrigerator and tell me the options within that. So I don't want to buy something which is 1 star. So basically the labeling program, the star and labeling program gives the information to the consumer which is very very important. Without information you can't properly optimize. So now the consumers along with initial cost, they are also taking into the consideration the flow that 
flow of you know expenditure they, that they will have on the electricity consumption there is another thing when the calculations are mostly carried out by us when we buy the electrical appliances or equipment this is the in terms of private cost so we see how much money am i going to spend from my own pocket i do not see that if i spend more money from my own pocket then probably it will lead to lowering of uh, you know energy use and therefore lowering of energy uh, lowering of emission now this lowering of energy use or lowering of emission these asso these associate some these are associated with some social benefit which may not reflect in terms of private benefit so there has to be a mechanism which transforms this social benefit and reflects into the private benefit of the customer who is buying this electrical appliance so when you are promoting energy efficiency as a policy measure then these are the things one has to be very careful about we actually take a very simple example to show you how the mind of a consumer works so here i have taken the example of two bulbs one is a 100 watt incandescent bulb and the other one is a 10 watt led bulb so what what are the different characteristics of these two bulbs so the power that these two bulbs are consume of course this is 100 watt and this is 10 watt the next one is the light that i produce so the energy amount of en this is my amount of energy consumption and this is the amount of energy service that i am producing so you again you may recall the discussion that we had in the initial lecture on energy demand we said that it's kind of tricky you choose the energy using appliance you choose the energy type and then you choose the level of energy use here we are talking about the use of the particular appliance so the light that is the energy service which is produced by these two equipment as are as follows so a 100 watt incandescent bulb will produce 1340 lumen that is the brightness of the light however a 10 watt led bulb will produce only 835 lumen so you can see that you cannot replace one incandescent bulb by one led bulb you have to have at least two 10 watt led bulb in order to replace 100 watt incandescent how much do i cost if i buy one of them then one incandescent cost 16 rupees whereas one led cost 240 rupees so there is a huge initial cost barrier so you go to the market the shopkeeper gives you two options one is 16 rupees one is 240 rupees it's very difficult to make a choice in favor of this 240 rupees and also on the other hand this 240 rupees is not enough to meet the lighting demand of 1340 so this is only for 835 you have to pay double so you actually have to pay 480 rupees so what is the energy intensity the energy intensity of the incandescent is approximately 0.075 whereas the in energy intensity of the led bulb is 0.012 so the energy intensity of this led bulb is much much low so this is going to be reflected in your electricity bill however the initial cost is going to be very high if you replace this is what i was i was saying if you replace one incandescent by two leds then the light you get is this is from one incandescent and this is from two leds so you have to replace one incandescent by two leds and therefore the energy that you consume here is 100 watt and energy that you consume here is only 20 watt so your regular energy consumption will be low but you have a fast cost barrier there so how much what is the cost that you incur if you buy one incandescent you pay 16 rupees to get the same amount of energy service if you buy two in can two led bulbs you actually have to spend 480 rupees so you can see the difference 16 rupees and 480 rupees it's huge it's like 3 30 times higher now comes the most important point that the consumer often overlooks what is that this part lifetime so one incandescent bulb can be used maybe for one year whereas if you buy one led it's going to last at least for 15 years so if you think about this 16 rupees and 480 rupees as an investment you are making this investment for one year so every year you have a recurring investment whereas if you invest this 480 rupees once then this investment is for 15 years now you can go back to the concept of growth rate that we had been discussing so here 
you every year you are spending 16 rupees here once you are spending 480 rupees had you kept this money in the bank and you know had the rate of interest in the bank been 5% then both 16 rupees each year and this 480 rupees for 15 years it would have been grown at 5% rate, average annual rate uh, growth of rate would have been 5% then what is the actual cost of these two equipment this is very important to understand see if you are buying 100 watt incandescent today you are paying 16 rupees if you are buying two leds then you are paying 480 rupees in a way if you compare these two figures you will see that led is 30 times more expensive as compared to incandescent this is the if i go to the market these are the two options i get this is the first thing that come to my mind however you as an economist we think a bit carefully what do we say we say see this 16 year 16 rupees is for one year whereas this 480 rupees is for 15 year now suppose what is the alternative use of this 16 rupees and 480 rupees if i do not buy the incandescent or if i do not buy the led i put this money in the bank i don't keep the money idle i put this money in the bank and my money will grow at an average annual rate of 5% so 16 rupees after one year 16 rupees will become 16.8 rupees as it has grown at 5% rate however if i keep this 480 rupees for 15 years in the bank this will become 997 or almost 990 rupees so almost 1000 rupees you can say so now see this 16 rupees i have to invest every year so every year i am losing 16.8 rupees and here i am losing 1000 rupees for 15 years so if i divide this 1000 rupees by 15 years this is my loss per year so here you see here you see this is only 16.8 per year this is the amount that you are losing if you are spending your money on one incandescent you are losing 39 or almost 40 rupees if you are buying two incandescent and incandescent so this is not exactly 30 times higher this is not even 3 times higher if you compare the cost in this way this is not even 3 times higher what you are spending per year but we do not take these things into consideration when we are carried away by the barrier of first cost now what can one do here comes the role of policies like bachat lamp yojana this is something that we had been discussing a couple of slides before this is one of the policies that were adopted for the market transformation for energy efficiency so cfl was distributed at 15 rupees so when the customer is going to the market she doesn't see the difference in the first cost between the cfl and the incandescent however if you are distributing cfl at rupees 15 then somebody is investing in that so the money is going from somebody's pocket how do you pay it back maybe it's government right but how do you pay back to the government you pay the government the government back when when you are using the cfls you are actually saving money in terms of reduced electricity bill so over a period of time you actually pay back that money to the government so it's again the same mechanism that you are removing the first cost barrier and you are distributing the payment over a period of time so this this is where the bachat lamp yojana policies like bachat lamp yojana come handy so as i was saying that you can you can go through this exercise you recall the concept of average annual growth rate and you see how you, how you actually come up to these figures of 16.8 and 40 where you see that the led is not at all 30 times expensive as compared to uh, incandescent it's not even 3 times expensive as compared to incandescent however the story doesn't end there why because this is only about the initial cost so in case of initial cost what you can see this is a 23 rupees difference these two thing it has a 23 rupees difference but over a period of 15 year you will be you know per year you will be able to save more than 23 rupees in terms of electricity bill so if you think about the present value of your expenditure of your investment in the type of equipment and if you also take into account the flow of expenditure that you are saving probably you will see at the end of the day led is much less expensive as compared to the incandescent i am not i have not included any of the social benefits that is being generated 
you have to import less you know like less energy you have to uh, you are reducing your carbon emission in spite of that those social benefits only in terms of private benefit also if you clearly make your calculations there is a possibility that you will see that leds are less expensive as compared to incandescent so here comes the role of information so what you see is that the customer has to understand what are the nuances of this information if you don't provide the customer with all this information then it's very difficult to make a choice again the problem is when you are going to the you know market to buy some equipment you do not sit with the data and do this kind of calculations right so what do you do these all these calculations they can be converted to a star rating so the star rating is actually telling you what is the energy efficiency so it it, it is actually giving you some kind of a lead and it so that you can avoid this kind of calculation yet you can focus on energy efficiency so we are going to stop here so we have discussed two main pillars of uh, demand side management one is load management and other is the energy efficiency in the next lecture what we are going to do we are going to look at a very interesting behavioral response which is called rebound effect which comes as a result of energy efficiency